Today's audiobook reading is dedicated in honor of Yehuda Aryaleh Ben Riva. Chapter 4 The Seven Areas in Which We Must Trust in God. The matters regarding which the believer in God is obligated to rely on the Creator are comprised of two different categories. The first category is matters that pertain to this world, and the second category is matters that pertain to the world to come. The first category itself, matters that pertain to this world, can be divided into two subcategories. The first subcategory consists of worldly matters that benefit the person in this world, while the second subcategory consists of worldly matters that benefit the person in the world to come. Furthermore, the subcategory of matters that benefit the person in this world can be divided into three categories. The first, matters that benefit the person himself. The second, matters that benefit his livelihood, as well as the sources of his wealth and various types of possessions. The third, matters that benefit members of his household, his wife, his close family members, his friends, his enemies, and people who are either more important or less important than him. The subcategory of worldly matters that benefit a person in the world to come can also be divided into two categories. The first, obligations of the heart and mitzvahs performed with the limbs, which pertain to him alone and do not benefit or cause harm to anyone else. The second, mitzvahs that are performed with the limbs and that cannot be performed without the participation of another person, with one person performing the act and the other being the recipient. Examples of such mitzvahs, charity, acts of kindness, teaching Torah, and instructing other people to do good or warning them against doing bad. Matters of the world to come can also be divided into two subcategories. One of them, the reward that a person receives in the world to come, which he deserves for his good deeds in this world. The second, the good that the person receives in the world to come because of the kindness of the Creator may he be exalted to the pious and the prophets. In total, there are seven categories of matters for which a person relies on the Creator. 1. Matters that pertain solely to the person himself. 2. Matters that pertain to his wealth and his means of livelihood. 3. Matters that pertain to his wife, children, family members, friends, and enemies. 4. Obligations of the heart and the mitzvahs performed with the limbs of the person that benefit or cause harm solely to the person himself. 5. Obligations performed with the limbs of the person that benefit or harm other people. 6. The reward in the world to come that is commensurate with the person's actions in this world. 7. The reward in the world to come that comes as a form of kindness from the Creator, blessed be He, to those who are treasured by Him and those who love Him. As it is written, Psalms 31.20 how abundant is your goodness that you have hidden for those who fear you. In the presence of man, you have acted for those who take refuge in you. Having explained in the previous two chapters the five foundational concepts that, as a result of recognizing them, it is possible for the person to have complete betachon in God, may he be exalted, it is now incumbent upon me to juxtapose the explanation of the proper manner in which a person should have betachon regarding each of the aforementioned seven categories. Through them, he will know how to go about having betachon in God, as well as the proper way to rely on others, if necessary. What concerns you is determined by God, yet you must take initiative. I will say as an explanation of the first category of the seven, which, as outlined above, consists of matters that pertain solely to the person himself, his life and death, food for his livelihood, clothing, shelter, health and illnesses, and character traits which a person needs in order to function well. Regarding each of these matters, the proper manner in which a person is to rely on God is to give himself over regarding all these matters to the predetermined ways in which the Creator has decided to conduct himself with him. He should rely on God, may he be blessed, and recognize that none of these matters come into being unless it has been predetermined by God that they are proper for him, both in this world and the world to come and that all will ultimately be for the best. He should also recognize that God conducts himself equally regarding all those matters, so that no other being's advice or behavior can help him, unless it is with God's permission and according to his decree and judgment. 
Just as a person understands that no being has power over his life or death, his illnesses or health, so too no being has any control over his livelihood, his other needs, his clothing, and the other matters pertaining to his body. However, accompanying the person's conviction that, one, all his matters are completely under the jurisdiction of the decrees of the Creator, may he be exalted, and that, two, everything that Creator chooses for him is the best choice, the person is also obligated to make efforts to pursue the means that will benefit him and to choose those means that appear to be the best. God will then do what he has already decreed. By way of comparison, although the end of a person's life and how long he will live have been fixed by the decree of the Creator, may he be blessed, the person must nevertheless pursue the means that preserve his life, such as food, drink, clothing, and living quarters, according to his needs. Regarding them, he is not to rely on God by saying, If it has been predetermined by the decree of the Creator that I should live, then he will keep me alive, even without food, for my entire life. And I will not exert myself in pursuing sustenance or in the toil that is necessary to obtain a livelihood that will pay for the sustenance. Placing Ourselves in Danger Similarly, it is unfitting for a person to place himself in danger as part of his reliance on the Creator's decrees, by drinking poisonous potions, or by fighting with a lion or other dangerous wild beasts, if he does not have to. Nor should a person jump into the sea or into fire, or endanger himself in any other similar manner in which a person cannot be sure of his safety. Scripture warns against this when it says, Deuteronomy 6.16 You shall not test the Lord, your God, as you tested him in Massa. There are two possible outcomes that will occur to someone who endangers his life. Either he will die and be considered as if he killed himself, and he will be punished in the world to come for doing so, as if he murdered another person, a terrible sin. This is so despite the fact that his death and the manner in which he died were decreed by God and done with his approval. The Torah has already warned us not to kill any person in any manner when it says in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20.13, Do not murder. In fact, the closer the relationship between the murdered person and the murderer, the harsher the punishment will be. As it is written, Amos 1.11, for pursuing their brother with a sword, and they destroyed their mercy. Another reason why the punishment of a person who kills himself is clearly so great is that in doing so, he is analogous to a servant whose master instructed him to guard a certain place for a certain amount of time and warned him not to leave until his master's messenger will come. Seeing that the messenger was tarrying, the servant left the place before the messenger arrived, and the master became angry with him and punished him harshly. Similarly, a person who kills himself forsakes the service of God, rebelling against him by placing himself in danger of death. Therefore we find Samuel of blessed memory saying, Samuel 1, 16, 2, How shall I go? For if Saul hears, he will kill me. It was not considered a lack of trust in God. Rather, God's response to him implied that his caution in this manner was praiseworthy. For he told him, A calf of cattle shall you take in your hands, and you shall say, I have come to offer sacrifices to the Lord, and the rest of the matter that it says there. Were his reluctance to place his life in danger to be considered a lack of trust in God, then God's response would have been the words of the verse, Deuteronomy 32:39 I cause death and grant life I strike but I heal or something similar as he indeed said to Moses of blessed memory at the time when Moses said to him Exodus 4:10 For I am heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue God replied in the following verse Who gave man a mouth or who makes one dumb or deaf or seeing or blind if Samuel, despite his complete righteousness, did not act lightly and place his life in even a slight risk of danger, even though were he to do so, he would be doing it at the instruction of the Creator, may he be blessed, who said, Samuel 1, 16, 1, Fill your horn with oil and come. I shall send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Then all the more so would it be considered morally reprehensible for another person to do so when he had not been commanded by the Creator himself. Alternatively, it is possible that he will be saved with the help of the Creator, may he be blessed, but he will lose some of his merits and thereby lose his reward that was due him for his good deeds. 
As our rabbis of blessed memory said, regarding this matter in the Talmud, Shabbat 32a, a person should never place himself in a dangerous situation and say that a miracle will be performed for him. For perhaps no miracle will be performed for him. If a miracle is performed for him, then it will be deducted from his merits. Similarly, we find by our forefather Jacob of blessed memory who said, Genesis 32.11, I have become small from all the kindnesses that God has bestowed upon me, which the Targum translates, My merits have been diminished as a result of all the goodness and kindness that you have done to me. The partnership, you and God. Just as we have said regarding life and death, that a person is obligated to keep steps to preserve his life and avoid the dangerous and deadly, so too we will say regarding a person's obligation to pursue means to remain healthy, the means to obtain food, clothing, shelter, and positive character traits, and to distance those things that stand in the way of their obtainment. These efforts are necessary despite a person's strong conviction that these means do not help him whatsoever, were it not for the Creator, may he be blessed, who decreed such. For example, a landowner must plow his land, clean it from thorns, sow it, and irrigate it if water becomes available to him. At the same time, he must rely on the Creator, may he be blessed, to bring forth the produce from the ground, to protect it from disasters, to make the produce plentiful, and that it be blessed by the Creator. He must not forsake the land without working on it or sowing it, relying on the decree of the Creator that the land will sprout forth vegetation without his previously having sown it. Similarly, this principle applies to other types of craftsmen, merchants, and paid workers. They are obligated to pursue their livelihood while at the same time relying on God that their sustenance is in His hands and control and that He is responsible to provide the person with his livelihood. He is able to fully provide him with it in any way he wishes, and a person should not think that the means in which he engages to obtain his livelihood will help or harm him at all. If his sustenance is obtained through one of the means in which he involved himself, it is not fitting for him to rely on that particular means to provide for him, and to rejoice in them, to obsess with them, and pay more attention to them, for by doing so, his trust in God will be weakened. Similarly, it is not fitting for him to think that his occupation will help him more than God has already decreed. He should not rejoice in his choice of this particular occupation, or in his efforts to obtain it. Rather, he should thank the Creator, who provided him with sustenance, subsequent to his toil, and who didn't cause his toil and trouble to be for naught. As it is written, Psalms 128.2, If you eat the toil of your hands, you are praiseworthy and it is good for you. One of the pious said, I am amazed at the person who gives his friend that which God has already decreed for him, and subsequently reminds the recipient of his kindness performed for him and asked to be thanked for it. I am even more amazed at the person who receives his sustenance through another person, who is forced to give it to him, and then he humbles himself in front of him, compliments him, and praises him. When everything seems to fail, if he does not obtain his livelihood through those means into which he puts his efforts, then he should consider that perhaps his daily sustenance is already in his possession, and he simply did not pay attention to it yet. Alternatively, it is possible that his livelihood will come to him through another means in which he did not yet put effort. In any event, it is still fitting for him to busy himself with means that could bring him livelihood. He should not be lax in pursuit, provided they are fitting for his character traits, his physical strength, his faith, and his world to come as I prefaced earlier. Combined with these efforts, he should rely on God that he will not forsake him in his time of need, nor weaken him, nor ignore him when misfortune befalls him. As the verse states, Nahum 1.7 The Lord is good. He is a stronghold on a day of trouble and is cognizant of those who trust in him. Similarly, we will say regarding health and illness, it is incumbent upon a person to rely on the Creator regarding this, but he is also obligated to make efforts for his continued health by using means that naturally help him remain healthy and to heal himself through the methods that people customarily use to cure diseases. As the Creator commanded us, Exodus 21.19,
and he shall surely be healed, which is understood to be an instruction from God to make efforts to heal ourselves. However, he should do so without relying on the causes of health and illness, believing that they in and of themselves have the ability to aid him or harm him. Rather, they can only do so when the Creator allows it. When a person relies on the Creator, he will heal him from his illness, either through the natural means in which the person engaged, or otherwise, as it says, Psalms 107.20, he will send forth his word, and he will heal them. It is possible that God will heal him using a substance that by nature is very harmful, as it is well known from the story of Elisha the prophet and the harmful water, which was causing the people to be ill. And God remedied the water with salt, which according to nature is the most harmful thing for water. As the verse states, Kings 2, 2, 19, the waters are bad and the land deadly. Similarly, when the Jewish people in Mara lacked water to drink because the water there was bitter, we find that the verse says, Exodus 15, 25, and the Lord instructed him concerning a piece of wood, which he cast into the water. And the ancient sages said that it was the wood of the Hardufni plant, which is a bitter tree. Similarly, the verse states, Isaiah thirty-eight twenty-one: Let them take a cake of pressed figs and lay it for a plaster on the boil, and it will heal. You already know that which transpired with King Asa of Judah, who when ill relied on the doctors to heal him and abandoned his trust in God, and how he was chastised and rebuked for it. Similarly, the verse says, Job 5.18 For he brings pain and binds it. He wounds and his hands heal. Pursue worldly means for your basic needs. We will now discuss the explanation of the proper bitachon a person should have regarding the second category, which is comprised of those matters that pertain to a person's property, the means through which he obtains his sustenance, and the manner in which he conducts himself in his business. Whether his occupation involves commerce, craft, or travel, appointment over certain tasks, or being a hired worker, a clerk, a servant of the king, a treasurer, a contractor, a merchant who buys on credit, a scribe, or any other type of service, or a trapper in the desert or the sea, and similar occupations in which people involve themselves to amass wealth and increase their livelihood beyond that which is necessary for them. The correct manner in which a person is to rely on God regarding them is to involve himself in those occupations that the Creator has prepared for him, but only as much as is necessary for his needs, for his food, in order to obtain those worldly matters necessary for him. If the Creator decrees that he will have additional livelihood than that which is necessary, then it will come to him without his exertion and toil, provided that he relies on God for it. He should not increase his efforts to pursue means for additional livelihood, nor should he rely on them in his heart. For if it has not been decreed that he will have any more sustenance than he needs, then even if all the beings that are in the heavens and the earth made efforts to increase his livelihood more than has been decreed for him, they would not be able to do so in any manner or through any means. When he will rely on God, he will find peace of mind and tranquility of the soul, since he knows that whatever has been designated for him will not be passed over to anyone else, and that his sustenance will not reach him earlier or later than the time in which it has been decreed. The Test of Wealth Sometimes the Creator directs the sustenance of many people through one person in order to test him, if he is serving God or rebelling against him. Such a test is among the most difficult of all trials and temptations for the person. An example of such a person would be a king who provides for his army and his servants. Similarly, ministers, advisors to the king, and their deputies who are surrounded by groups of servants, assistants, officials, wives, and relatives for whom they make efforts to pursue means of amassing wealth through both good and bad ways. The foolish among them make three mistakes. Their first mistake is in the manner in which he amasses wealth. He obtains that which the Creator has decreed for him to take through bad and shameful means. Were he to make efforts to obtain it by employing permissible and appropriate means, he would still achieve his wants and desires. Simultaneously, 
he would have managed to uphold his Torah observance while doing well in his worldly matters, and he would not be lacking anything from that which the Creator decreed for him. The second mistake that he makes is his belief that all the wealth that has come to him is for his own sustenance. But he doesn't recognize that a person's income is divided into three categories. The first, the income for his sustenance, which refers to that which nourishes the person himself. This category of income is guaranteed by God for every living being until its end of days. The second, the income that a person receives for the sustenance of others such as his wife, children, servants, assistants, and the like. This category is not guaranteed to come from God for all of his creations. Rather, it only comes to a select few. These people receive it based on specific qualities that they possess. This category of income will be occasional. At times it will be available, and at other times it will not be available. Whether the person will receive this extra income or not, will be based on the Creator who rules the world with kindness and judgment. The third, the income that he amasses, which refers to the money that benefits no one. Instead, he guards it and protects it until he will either pass it on as an inheritance to someone else or it will be lost from him. The foolish person considers all the money that the Creator has decreed to be his in the category of income that is for his own sustenance and his own needs. Therefore, he hurries to obtain it and makes efforts for it, despite the possibility that he is amassing the wealth for the future husband of his wife, his murderer, or his greatest enemy, who will inherit it after his death. The third mistake that a foolish person makes is that while he does give over the sustenance to his owners, as the Creator has indeed ordained that it come through him, he reminds them of his favor toward them, as if he himself sustained them and provided them with the needs from his own money and was kind to them through the sustenance he provided. Therefore, he wants them to thank and praise him profusely on account of the money that he provided them with and to serve him as a result. Due to his perceived generosity, he becomes arrogant, haughty, and proud, and he refrains from thanking God for giving him the opportunity to provide for them. He thinks to himself that were he to withhold his wealth from them, it would remain in his possession and that were it not for him, their sustenance would cease. In truth, he is the one of poor intellect who toiled for naught in this world and who will lose his heavenly reward in the world to come. However, the wise person conducts himself regarding these three matters in the proper manner, for the good of his Torah observance as well as the good of his worldly matters. His trust in God for his sustenance and wealth, which is in the hands of God, is stronger than his trust in the money that is already in his possession. This is because he does not know if the money he currently has is the income for his sustenance or if it is the income that he amasses that might be taken away from him. By conducting himself in this manner, he attains honor in this world as well as reward of the world to come, as the verse says in Psalms 112. Praise the Lord, Fortune is the man who fears the Lord, and as it carries on there until the end of the chapter. The Mistake in Seeking Wealth for Honor There are some groups of people whose efforts to acquire and increase their wealth are solely due to their love of honor that they think they will receive from people as a result of their wealth and so that they can make a name for themselves. No amount of money is ever enough for them because they think that the more money they have, the more honor they will receive. This foolishness of theirs stems from their lack of understanding regarding the true cause of what makes a person deserving of honor in this world and in the world to come. The cause for this mistake of theirs is that they see how the masses honor wealthy people. The masses' honor for the wealthy is born out of a hope that they will benefit from what the wealthy have and that they will receive some of the wealth that is in their hands. Were the masses to think deeply into the matter, and understand that the wealthy neither have the ability nor the power to give or withhold money to anyone other than the one for whom it has been decreed by the Creator, they would not rely on anyone else other than God to provide for them. No person would be worthy of their honor except for one who has been distinguished by the Creator with praiseworthy character traits for which he is worthy to be honored by the Creator, may he be exalted. As it is written, Samuel 1, 2, 30. 
For those who honor me, I will honor them. Since the masses are foolish in their honoring of the wealthy, thinking that the latter are deserving of their honor, the Creator adds to their foolishness when it comes to pursuit of their desires. And throughout their lifetimes, they need to overindulge in strenuous work in order to obtain their wealth. They thereby neglect to swiftly fulfill obligations that the Creator has imposed upon them. They also neglect to thank God for His goodness that He gives them. Were they to do so, they would be without a doubt far more successful in obtaining their desires, as the verse says, Proverbs 3.16, in reference to the Torah. Length of days is in its right, in its left are riches and honor. And as it says, Chronicles 1, 29, 12, and wealth and honor are from before you. It's not your ingenuity, it's God. Among those who seek wealth, there are those who obtain all their desires through one of the various means of obtaining a livelihood that we mention above, while there are others who obtain their desires through an inheritance or the like. That person thinks that it is the means of livelihood or the inheritance that made him wealthy, and without them, he would not have obtained any money at all. He praises the means and not the cause, God. Thinking Ahead This man is similar to a person traveling in the desert who becomes dehydrated and finds bitter water in a well, and he greatly rejoices at finding the water and quenches his thirst with it. However, as he journeys a little further, he finds a spring that is flowing with sweet water. He is distressed that he previously drank the bitter water and quenched his thirst with it. Similarly, the wealthy person whose wealth reached him through a particular means that involved much toil, were he to have stopped himself from engaging in that particular means, he would have managed to obtain his wealth through different, easier means, as explained earlier. As it says, Samuel 1, 14, 6, For with the Lord there is no limitation to save with many or with few. Reflections on Financial Struggles The proper thing for a person who trusts in God to do during the days in which his livelihood is withheld from him is to say to himself, He who brought me out of the womb into this world at a specific time and specific moment, and who did not bring me into the world before that time or afterwards, he is the one who is withholding my sustenance from me until a specific time and a specific day in accordance with what he knows to be best for me. Similarly, when his sustenance comes to him but is limited, and he receives no more than what he needs for his food, it is proper to think to himself and say, He who prepared my food for me in the bosom of my mother when I was born, according to my needs and enough to sustain me each and every day until he exchanged it for better food, and the fact that the milk was limited did not harm me whatsoever, so too, this limited sustenance, which is according to my needs, to which God has currently brought me, will not harm me whatsoever, even if it continues this way until the end of my life. A person who relies on God despite his minimal livelihood will be rewarded for doing so. As the Creator said regarding our forefathers in the desert, whose situation was similar to this person, as evident from the verse, Exodus 16.4, And the people shall go out, and gather what is needed for the day. As it says, Jeremiah 2.2, 2, Go out and call in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, So says the Lord, I remember regarding you, the loving kindness of your youth, the love of your nuptials, your following me in the desert, in a land not sown. Similarly, if his sustenance comes through a means that he did not want, or from a place that he did not want, or if he received his livelihood from a person he did not want to receive it from, he should say to himself, He who fashioned me with a particular form and shape, with certain character traits and dimensions, and did so because this is what is best for me, he is the one who chose for me that my sustenance should come about in ways that are most suitable for my purposes and not in other ways that are not in my best interests. He who brought me out of my mother's womb into this world in a specific place and through two particular parents, and not through any other people in the world, he is the one who chose for me that my sustenance should come in a certain land and through a certain person. He chose that a person or place to be the means of my livelihood for my good. As the verse states, Psalms 145.17,
The Lord is righteous in all his ways. Proper attitude and social interactions. However, the explanation regarding the proper betachon in the third category, which is comprised of those matters that pertain to his wife, children, members of his household, relatives, friends, enemies, people whom he holds in high esteem, acquaintances, as well as superiors and subordinates from different classes of people, the proper way to rely on God regarding them is as I will relate. A person cannot escape from one of the following two scenarios. 1. Either he will be estranged, living alone, or 2. He will live amongst his family and close ones. Dealing with Loneliness If he is estranged, living alone, then he should connect with God at the time of his loneliness, and he should rely on God in his state of estrangement. In order to comfort himself, he should dwell on the fact that the soul is also estranged in this world, and that all the people of the world are considered as strangers in it. As the verse says, Leviticus 25.23, For you are strangers and temporary residents with me. He should think to himself that even all those people who have close ones in this world will, in a short amount of time, revert to being strangers and alone, and neither a person's close one nor his child, will be able to help him then, nor will they be able to connect with him. After this, he should think about the fact that due to his living alone, the weight of those people's loads, responsibilities, and needs have been removed from him. He should consider this removal to be one of the kindnesses of the Creator to him. For if he is a person who pursues worldly matters and his needs, his work will be much less of a strain on him if he does not have a wife and children. It emerges that the lack of wife and children is the cause for his rest and for his own good. If he is a person who seeks the matters of the world to come, spiritual matters, then his mind will, without a doubt, be more unoccupied and free to pursue these matters when he is alone than if he had a family with which he busied himself. This is why the ascetics would flee from their relatives and houses to the mountains, so that they could free their hearts and minds to focus on the service of God. Similarly, the prophets, at the time of prophecy, would leave their places of residence and seclude themselves so they could free their minds to ponder fulfilling the obligations imposed on them by the Creator. As you know from the story of Elijah and Elisha, about whom the verse states, Kings 1, 19, 19, 12 yokes were before him, and he was with the twelfth. Since Elijah subtly hinted to him that he would be a prophet, Elisha understood him and said, in the following verse, Please allow me to kiss my father and my mother, and I will go after you. And the following verse states, And he followed Elijah and ministered to him. The story is told of an ascetic who went to a certain country to teach his inhabitants about the correct way to serve God. He found that they were all wearing the same colored clothing and ornaments. Their grave sites were next to the doors of their homes, and he did not see any women among them. When he asked them about this, they replied, the reason why we all wear the same colored clothing is so that it should not be distinguishable between the poor and the rich, and so that the rich will not end up arrogant and boastful about his wealth, and so that the poor will not despise himself, and he should think of his life on this earth in the same manner as when he will be underneath it, after his passing. It is said about one of the kings that he would mingle among his servants and could not be identified among them because he conducted himself humbly in regard to the clothes and ornaments that he wore. As to the reason why we place our grave sites next to the doors of our houses, it is in order that we should take rebuke from it, by being ready for death, and to prepare for ourselves the provisions that will bring us to the place of rest. That which you notice that we separated ourselves from our wives and children, you should know that we designated a city for them nearby. When one of us needs something from them, he goes to them, and takes care of his needs, and he then returns to us. We did this because we saw the stress, much loss, great exertion, and toil that would come to us as a result of being in proximity to them, and the relief from all of this due to our distance from them, enabling us to be free to choose to engage in matters of the world to come and to detest the matters of this world. Their words found favor in the eyes of the ascetic who had visited them and he blessed and praised them for their practices. Dealing with family and friends If the person trusting in God has a wife, family members, 
friends, and enemies, then he should rely on God to save him from the burden usually associated with being involved with them. And he should make efforts to meet his obligations toward them and to take care of their wants and to do so wholeheartedly. He should avoid doing anything that will cause them harm. Instead, he should engage in the means that will bring them good and he should be loyal to them regarding all their matters. He should teach them the appropriate way to conduct themselves, both in Torah matters and in worldly matters, which will benefit them in their service of their Creator. As it is written, Leviticus 19.17, You shall love your fellow as yourself. And as it says in the preceding verse, Leviticus 19.16, You should not hate your brother in your heart. He should not do so with the hope that his favors will be repaid nor to repay them for the good that they already did for him. It should not be done out of love for the honor and praise that they will give him, nor in order to rule over them. Rather, it should be done to fulfill the mitzvah of the Creator, to observe his covenant and his instructions concerning them. For a person who performs their requests while having in mind one of the aforementioned selfish reasons will not achieve his own desires that he expected from them in this world. He will have toiled for nothing and he will lose his reward in the world to come. However, if his conduct in the above is solely for the sake of divine service, then God will help them repay him in this world, and he will place in their mouths this person's praise, and God will make him great in their eyes. Additionally, he will also arrive at his great reward in the world to come. As God said to King Solomon, Kings 1, 3, 13, And I have also given you that which you have not asked both riches and honor. People helping people. However, the manner with which to have betachon and God regarding the matters that pertain to someone who is of a superior or subordinate class of people, the proper way to conduct himself with them is as follows. When the need arises for a person to make a request of either his superior or his subordinate, he should rely on God to deliver his request and consider those people of whom he made the request to be merely the messenger whom God will use to complete his request. This is just like a person who chooses working the land and sowing it to be the means of his livelihood. In which case, if the Creator wishes that he be sustained by it, then the seed will sprout forth and be fruitful and multiply. Nevertheless, it is obvious that he shouldn't give thanks to the earth for this. Rather, thanks are owed to the Creator alone. If, however... God does not wish to sustain him from it, then the earth will not sprout forth any vegetation. Alternatively, it will sprout forth vegetation, but something adverse will happen to it. In both of these cases, it is obvious that the earth is not to blame. Similarly, when he requests an object from one of these people, who is either above him or below him, he should consider the weak person and the strong person as equally able to perform his request, not placing any more trust in the stronger person. He should rely on God, blessed be he, that his request will be fulfilled. If his request is fulfilled by one of the people, then he should thank the Creator, blessed be he, who fulfilled his wishes. He should also thank the person through whom the favor was done, for his good-heartedness and for the fact that the Creator brought his benefits through him. For it is well known that, Generally speaking, the Creator does not cause good to come to other people except through the righteous, and only rarely does He cause loss through them. As our sages of blessed memory said, Bhava Basra 119b, Merit is brought about by means of a person who is meritorious, and liability is brought about by means of a person who is liable. Similarly, it says, Proverbs 12.21, No wrong shall be caused for the righteous. If his request was not fulfilled by the people he turned to, he should not blame them, nor should he blame it on the lack of effort on their part. Instead, he should thank God, who chose to withhold his request from him for his own good. And he should praise the people of whom he made the request, based on his knowledge of their efforts that they invested to fill his request, even though it did not materialize according to his wishes or the wishes of the people who wanted to help him. This is how a person should conduct himself with his friends and acquaintances, as well as with those with whom he does business and with his servants and partners. Similarly, if either a superior or subordinate of his makes a request of him, he should wholeheartedly make every effort to perform it, 
but if possible, he should try to complete the request in private so that he will not become haughty as a result. The above only applies if the person who asked him for the request is someone who is deserving of his efforts on his behalf. After making these efforts, he should rely on God to help him fulfill the person's request. If the request ends up being fulfilled through his efforts, because God placed him in the position of being the conduit for the other person's good, he should not attribute his success to himself, and he should not ask for recompense or thanks from the other person. Rather, he should thank God for choosing him to do this good for his friend. If, however, he was prevented from fulfilling the request, and he was not able to do it, he should not blame himself. He should inform his friend that he was not lazy in his efforts on his behalf, provided that he did, in fact, exert himself in toil on this person's behalf. Dealing with Enemies However, with regard to matters pertaining to his enemies, those who covet his possessions and those who seek to do bad to him, he should rely on the Creator, may he be exalted. He should tolerate when they embarrass him, and he should not take retribution from them according to their misdeeds. Rather, he should repay them with kindness and do for them any good that he is able to do for them. He should remember that ultimately, any benefit that he receives and all harm that comes to him is in the hands of the Creator, may he be exalted. If they cause him harm, he should think good about them, and he should suspect that it is himself and his previous misdeeds towards God that are the cause of his misfortune. He should offer supplications to God and beg him to forgive his sins. If he does this, then his enemies will return to love him. As the wise man King Solomon said, Proverbs 16.7 when the Lord accepts a person's ways, he will cause even his enemies to make peace with him. 